culture of debate, um, the culture of civic participation uh, is fast receding. Um, the culture of negotiations, of, of political deal making, not in the commercial monetary sense, uh, such as the ones that founding fathers of our country used to do when they were having conferences, constitutional conferences, both in Nigeria and outside. All that culture is fast, um, fast gone, maybe because of the military incursion into our politics. In other words, the art of politics itself is fast disappearing. These days, politicians and political leaders are more militant than even militants, or more militant than even the military. The art of conversation, the art of consensus building, the art of agreeing and disagreeing on issues, but in the national interest. Uh, that art is fast disappearing. And uh, this is one of the elements we want to bring back into our national consciousness, particularly uh, while talking about and addressing political issues that affect us as a people. Uh, now coming to your question, you're talking about uh, the national security challenges, which is very serious. I agree with you, the bloodletting going on in our country, uh, almost in all parts of the country. Banditry, kidnapping, hostage taking, piracy in the creeks, and Islamic fundamentalism and terrorism in the Northeast, because that is the proper name to call it, it's Islamic terror, which has to be confronted and defeated. Um, that is going on, that has been going on for about uh, 10 years now in the Northeast, Boko Haram. And now you now have a convergence of ISWAP, that is the Islamic State of West Africa, um, Boko Haram, in the entire Sahel, entire Sahel region, and with the situation in Shad, um, what it means is that um, the national security challenges with respect to terror, Islamic terror, will even get worse. Um, and now you have secessionist agitations. And uh, these are the areas that we want young people, a um, lot of people, to be part of these kinds of dialogue so we can examine and interrogate the national dilemma in all these forms. But while doing so, also assure all of us that um, there is still hope and all is not lost. All is not lost. And I would like all of us to take that home. Yes, the country has challenges. And every nation has its own peculiar challenges. Up till now, uh, the British are still talking about the issues of devolution in the devolved nations of Scotland, of Wales, of Northern Ireland, and all of that. That is, our colonial masters are still talking about that. So every nation is a work in progress, and ours is not an exception. But we must not deceive ourselves. There are issues, there are challenges, and we must uh, frankly um, examine the challenges, and those who pretend, those who are leaders, or those who hold themselves out as leaders, must be alive to these challenges and not uh, play, not be playing convenient politics. Speak when it is only convenient for them, and dodge the challenges and the issues, you know, and uh, um, fan the embers of religious divide and ethnicity, uh, which, which these are the problems of the country, instead of leaders addressing the challenges. Take, for example, the, uh, the secessionists, Ajay, as I said on the floor of the Senate the other day, the Nigerian dream didn't start today. This was the dream that started with the likes of uh, late Herbert Macaulay, and sometimes even others before him. The Zik who took over from him, and then uh, Chief Awolo. Well, Ario, yes, that, could, that is also a part of it. That's also a part of it. And it's not an accident that since after the likes of Zeke, Awolowo, and all of that, who wrote several books 
You've not seen contemporary uh, leaders yes. of Nigeria and of Africa, especially writing books. And I don't know how many of them even find time to read as much. So knowledge always has a place in leadership because the leader has to have the requisite knowledge, not only of the past, but of the present challenges, and then come up with a vision for the future so that you can have a combination of vision, passion to drive it, and then compassion to guide the exercise of power. So I agree with you completely. Knowledge has its place. And uh, particularly knowing the history, particularly of a diverse nation like Nigeria, is, 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 is indispensable. Unfortunately, at some point in our national life, even the study of history was downplayed. Uh, I hear it has come back, and the sooner people know more about our nation, particularly those who uh, are offering themselves up for leadership, because leadership is key. It's leaders who come up with vision. It's leaders who drive society, take society from the level they've met it, understanding how that society evolved to that point, and then come up with a vision for a better uh, future. Uh, so there's always room for knowledge. And um, we, we, in this country, we do have leaders who uh, have tried their best. Um, one leader who has taken time to write a lot is uh, President Obasanjo, General Obasanjo. Yes, so he's always found time to write his experiences, his thoughts, and his actions. And I've always encouraged as many leaders that I've interacted with, and so many of them, military and civil, uh, to try to document their own experiences for the benefit of posterity. And I think we're also making some, uh, some, some progress in that regard. Let, let me also add to the country. Okay, now, talking specifically about insecurity and why we are where we are. The first is historical, uh, which is why you move like that. We are basically a nation of proud African kingdoms with their own systems and ancient civilizations. For example, like the Karen Bononu, they've been there for over a thousand years, or, or Benin, over a thousand years. Before the British came, they were speaking Portuguese in the Benin Palace, Obas Palace. Yes, there's a church there, old church, built in the 15th century. The Chekri Palace, the Olu was speaking Portuguese. They were interacting, conducting foreign, foreign uh, affairs, diplomacy. The Pere of uh, Boni, the King of Boni, my number of Boni, in 18 something, sent his child to England. His son was a ward of Queen Victoria in England. And so also, several other kingdoms in Nigeria until the British came and then brought us together. But what are the systems that we have evolved that speak to our security, that can aid our security? From independence, you know, we had this native authority, police, and so on and so forth. But with the population explosion and the modern systems that were important, particularly after military rule, 1978, we now had a system where the presidential system was adopted. And the presidential system is, in essence, a monarchy. The American executive, the notion of American executive presidency is a monarchy. We've imported it in, now running a very distant government from the people, as opposed to the British parliamentary system, where everybody will elect their own representatives. So the structure of the Constitution the federal system that we're supposed to be operating is only federal in name. That is a major structural problem. Because the federal list, the exclusive list, is so long, so unwieldy, and covers almost everything, and thereby isolating the people from the essential you know, um, governance of themselves, particularly on the area of security and law and order which is the first duty of the Federation. 
We have taken it up in the, in the 1999 Constitution, 19, borrowing from the 78th Constitution. But then you have not given the states roles, you have not given the local governments roles, which is where our people live. So structurally, you've got a problem. And because the exclusive list is so overloaded, the federation, and this is the point, the federation does not have the resources and the time, and even is not paying attention to those core areas of its essential mandate of providing security and law and order. And take, for example, you now say that the Fed, you have a federal police. Before we talk about the issues of devolution, but the scenario now is that the Constitution says you have a federal police. But you have not talked about how you fund it. You have not talked about how you safeguard the man who heads the police, that is the IG. You've made it so federal in such a way that one man sits in Abuja and then will be policing this vast nation of over 200 million people without their input. You can't fund it. Funding is key. So I made the point the other day when I visited the IG that unless, and that is the truth, gentlemen, we've got to be alive to it as a nation. The sooner we wake up to that, the better for this country. You, a nation where the police, which is the foremost law and order agency in any country, that's the foremost first line law and order agency. They are not funded, they are not trained, they are not equipped, they are not mobile, they are not well paid, and therefore not, not, not well motivated. They are grumbling, salaries are peanuts. When they retire, no matter the rank, it is peanuts, they can't live on it, in service and out of it. Where they stay is slums. In any such country, you can't have security. Because the frontline agency for fighting crime and criminality is the police. And the strength of the society in terms of law and order rests on the police, the average police constable. Not the senior officer sitting in an air-conditioned room in Abuja or a state headquarters. That is why in most countries where you, you, where, that are safe, you see the police patrolling, not with sophisticated weapons. Yes, they could have their armed units to deal with uh, such matters, insurgencies and so on. But the regular police guys that keep everybody safe with their buttons, with their patrol cars, with communication, and they are well trained, and they know the locality. They are also known. And people look forward to working there. They don't take school dropouts. They take competent people, very intelligent people, well motivated, trained, equipped. Once you do that, you have dealt with the basic area of local security. And you connect those people with the communities, every street, every community. Even in around, around us, you go to some countries, once you enter some of these countries, in the next 30 minutes, one hour, the authorities will know that somebody, maybe even a Nigerian, has entered into Chad, Niger, Cameroon, and so on. You don't have that system in this country. We have not built it. If it was there before, we have destroyed it. So we've got to go back to basics, which is why the army now is so overstretched. Yes, in the laws, it is permissible for the army or the military to perform some policing duties in aid of civil authorities. But it is now everywhere in the country. So the soldiers who are not trained to handle civil maintenance of law and order, which is normal policing jobs, even mounting roadblocks, performing normal, ordinary police jobs, they are everywhere in almost every state of the country, in every state of the Federation. So that, the failures of the police, the collapse of the police, the abandonment of the police is one of the main problems we have. Then you also have, as I said earlier, the structural problems. Because even the police, you have to interrogate it. How do you structure this police that has to be effective? If you look at what is happening in most countries, you have different layers. You have the federal police system. 
you have the county police, you have the state police, even universities, big corporations have their own police. And they have a way of tying it, you know, one to the other and with the judicial system. We haven't done that. So um, this is why we are where we are. And in a country that is this complex, country that is big, vast, and uh, with this massive population, and youth population for that matter, coupled with unemployment, and then an economy that is uh, in recession, um, we are bound to be where we are. We are bound to be where we are. Okay. So, so, so this takes us into probably uh, uh, may be able to do. I'm of the view that the president has not risen sufficiently to the challenges of leadership. Uh, because in our system, the president is not just president. The president is president, number one. He is commander-in-chief, number two. He is the head of state, number three. And number four, he is the leader of the country. That is what we have in our presidential system, which I don't agree with. I don't believe it is the right thing for us in our circumstances, too distant, too far, too, too costly. But that's the system we have. The president has no reason to the occasion of using the influence and authority of his office to galvanize the country. It's even too silent on these grave issues that threaten the fabric of our country. The president ought to give a clear directive, even on these issues of amendments, you know, because the president's party has even comfortable majority in the National Assembly. So if there is any law, if there are any laws to be amended, as I'm talking of devolution, uh, and having a robust national dialogue on the way and manner that the law enforcement agencies should be structured, I believe that it is the duty of the president, as leader of the country, uh, to rise to the occasion and lead that challenge. For example, he has an attorney general, he has a, a vice president who is a senior lawyer, uh, he has his team, should have his team, and then call for input from others. And I give you an instance. When 1998, 1999, President Obasanjo came into office and the Niger Delta was boiling, uh, the next day Obasanjo flew to the Niger Delta. Personally, didn't send a team. Flew to worry, flew to this, flew to that. That was how this idea of NDDC and so on came up. The same thing with the Aradwa. When he came in uh, 2007, and he saw the insurgency in the Niger Delta and so on, he responded, visited so many places, held several other meetings at the villa and in other places. Some of them I participated, then I was Attorney General of the state. And that led to the establishment of the Niger Delta, Ministry of Niger Delta first, and then ultimately also to the amnesty program. Presidential leadership, presidential initiative. Now, in this one, there has been none. There has been none. For me, um, the issues of devolution, amendment of the Constitution that will aid that, are best done if you have the presidential muzzle behind it. First, from his own party, and then invoking the notion of uh, bully pulpit, according to the Americans, bully pulpit, using the authority and the influence of his office to advance a worthy cause. But the presidency is silent, apart from press statements from spokesmen. There's no presidential clear leadership. And that is what uh, has resulted. For example, look, the agitations from the Southeast, you can quell them by, for example, a large meeting by the president, initiated by the president, with the leaders of the Southeast, and possibly a visit by the president of the republic to the Southeast and having that dialogue with all their kings, all the business leaders, all the political leaders, all the young leaders, all the women leaders, stakeholders in Enugu or any other preferred place, and the president sleeping there to demonstrate the fact that I have heard you. We have heard your point. You are not right in the way young people are going, but you see, we have this nation for all of us to build together. The president has to reach out. But this presidency is silent, and that's what I mean by lack of leadership. Not only in the amendments of the Constitution, 
not only in addressing some of these challenges, but also by clear political leadership, we have not had. It's not too late. It can still be done. Sir, this response needs because it's important. Those who are in leadership positions must rise to the occasion at all times. Speaking the truth when you need to. Saying no when no is the right answer. Across all parties, not just Mr. President, if the right thing is not done, all of us must speak. If there are wrong things that are done, even against the president, against the administration, we should condemn it too, in the same light. But, so that is it. Thank you very much. When people say restructuring means different things to different people, that is not a true and correct statement. That's not true at all. It is actually an attempt to confuse the subject matter of restructuring. Restructuring doesn't mean anything other than a profound constitutional reform. That's what it means. Some of that reform could affect the very structures of our country and the institutions. I've just talked about the police. There is the judiciary, for example, where, as it is now, any land dispute from our villages, eh? our villages, will get to the Supreme Court of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Now, that is not the right thing. So we, in, in restructuring, we've got to talk about the role of the judicature. What kind of judiciary should Nigeria have? So you are going to deal with all of that. And all of this will end up in a constitutional amendment. So the call for restructuring is not about secession of Nigeria. And please, let's stop this and stand up to this arrogance by some Nigerians who feel that they are more Nigerian than others or that they love Nigeria more than others. That is crap. Those like me for several years and elder statesmen who have always been talking about civil society, professional bodies, lead, former leaders of our country, current leaders who are talking about restructuring are no less Nigerians than those who for now, either do not understand the concept or may not be in support. Restructuring is a broad subject matter when we talk of constitutional reforms. For example, devolution is an aspect of restructuring. But devolution is not coterminous with restructuring. It's not the same thing with restructuring. You have form of government. For example, I, I prefer the parliamentary system because that was what our founding fathers agreed with the British before we had independence. Before they handed over the territories and the various kingdoms that the British colonial authorities had, treaties and conquests that they did over all the native areas in this country. When they were going, we had conferences. And one of it even led to the appointment of the Willings Commission 1957, in London, when they said, look, minority, so-called minorities felt, look, in this big Nigeria you want to give us to, hand us over to, we don't feel safe. So, queen or king, how do you protect us? That issue came. Minorities everywhere raised that issue. And they set up a commission, Willings, Henry Willings Commission. And it was from there, this idea of protecting the fundamental rights of all Nigerians in an independent Nigerian nation with an independent judiciary was agreed upon. So we had agreements. We had agreements. The military came, 66. And by the way, it was late General Ronsi who signed that unification decree and then brought, collapsed all the regional structures that were agreed upon and brought all systems together. And of course, you saw the, the pushback from the northern officers and the northern establishment who were rightly alarmed, rightly alarmed. And I don't believe, now looking at history, that those, those fears and uh, were, were properly, just as now that we're not properly managing uh, the, 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 the 
uh, concerns and fears of people. So from 66 till now, we are operating a system that we never agreed to before the British left this country. We never agreed on this bogus presidential system without controls. When the American colonies in, 19, um, in 1776 fought for independence, they replaced the British monarchy with their own type of monarchy known as American executive presidential monarchy. America, the presidential system is a monarchy. It's a king. Very far from the people, pomp and pageantry, and all of that, as opposed to the simple British system where the prime minister is the leader of the, of the, of the House of Commons and he forms his government, simple government, with ministers from the, from the parliament. And that was what we agreed. That's what we were running. So we have departed from it. So the call for restruction at the more profound level is a return to the essential agreements that we had before we became independent, i.e., the 1960 Constitution, the 1963 Constitution that we had. Yes, there are issues there that we can talk about, and we shouldn't be talking about, we shouldn't run away from agreements and disagreements. That's normal. So, but the idea of restructuring means constitutional reform. But in it, you have different notions. There is a notion of devolution, devolving power from this oversized federal system, supposedly federal system that is unitary, to the constituent parts. And in it, you need to have a necessary conversation about what are even the federating units. That is a legitimate point for, for, for discussion. Yes. So you have devolution of power. Then you have form of government in this restructuring conversation. All of that is there. You have the issues of the judiciary or the judicature. You have the issues that have to do with policing and law and order. And so on. You have the issues of mineral rights. In the area of mineral rights, let me tell you what this country did. In an independent nation, Nigeria, through positive legislations passed by the military, 1960 to 1970, they passed all these military decrees, taking away, or let me use a better word, expropriating the resources of the indigenous peoples of the Niger Delta. It wasn't so at independence. It wasn't so until the military came. So these are elements, various elements, and several more in the restructuring debate. So when people say, oh, restructuring means different things and so on, well, either they're speaking out of crass ignorance, regrettably, some of them do not understand, or they may just be deliberately confusing the subject matter. Otherwise, restructuring does not mean dismemberment of Nigeria, no. Those who are calling for restructuring, such as I, are believers in a big, strong Nigeria, but a Nigeria that is fair and equal, a Nigeria that is accommodating to all, a Nigeria that can sustain the dreams of the African, of the black man. Because this country was conceived. You see, this is the point a lot of people have made, including some in authority. They think that this country is there for one ethnic group in Nigeria or for one religious group. No, that is wrong. And that is arrogance. We are Nigerians. Nobody believes in dismemberment of this nation. And I want to use this opportunity to call, uh, to tell all these people who are talking of, because of their, 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 their concerns and their anger and their loss of faith in the Nigerian dream, uh, talking of going different ways, that that is not the solution. The challenge is a challenge of nation building. It's a challenge of enthroning justice in Nigeria. And any nation you want to go and form, you still have that challenge. You still have that challenge of formulating effective systems that are fair and just, that can 
deliver service to the people, that can guarantee well-being uh, and, uh, of your people. So those are the challenges we need to face. And so restructuring means constitutional reform. And those of us who are in support of restructuring are Nigerian patriots. As a matter of fact, with what we know and what is going on in Nigeria, and our, um, our conjectures as to where the country may lead to, if not restructured, I can safely say that anyone at this point in time in Nigerian history against restructuring is not a friend of Nigeria. It's not in support of the Nigerian dream. Because if you want a Nigeria that is balanced, a Nigeria that can live up to the dreams as the, as the giant of Africa, then you must have a Nigeria that everybody is happy with, a Nigeria that has justice and equity. And that's what restructuring means. Some of the, some of the sentiments, yes, I agree with, but not anyone. We're not here to trade blames. I'm not here to trade insults. We are here to address national issues. Uh, national issues. Um, Nigerian unity is desirable. Let me make that point again. Nigerian unity is highly desirable. Nigerian unity is highly beneficial to everyone and every group in Nigeria. The sol that's why I keep saying that the solution is not to break up Nigeria. The challenge is a challenge of leadership. The challenge is a challenge of formulating systems and institutions that can guarantee and strengthen and support the Nigerian citizen. So I'm not talking of ethnic rights. I'm talking of empowering the Nigerian citizen, wherever you are, whether you are a farmer or you are a cattle herder. You're a Nigerian, and you've got to be protected by the laws, by the institutions, and the systems in Nigeria. So. Um, yes, there may very well be people who say convoke a national government, but you have, you have a national assembly in place. I know the challenges that come with that if people are not sufficiently open-minded and people have preconceived notions. But if you have a national assembly where people are equally patriotic and we must assume that everybody is, and then we are prepared to look at these issues dispassionately, there may not be any need. There is enough, in my view, a lot of reports uh, that are, in the, that are in, in, in the bookshelves, not just the 2014 report. And by the way, if, if the convener of 2014, uh, Comfab, was, was serious about this, there was enough time to have executed it. Uh -huh. so, so let's go. But we can work with that, some of it, then um, with all the other uh, reports, that are there, and then uh, come up with, uh, uh, with an amendment, even if the National Assembly, we can replace even the Constitution as it is. Yes. Yes. Your Excellency, uh, first, uh, let me say the... The National Assembly as presently constituted can do that. Um, well, I, I have come to join the National Assembly well in this second uh, bit. I was there in the House of Reps, um, 2007, until I went to become governor. And now for the past four months I've been in the Senate, I'm in the Constitution Amendment Committees, and uh, I see some zeal. I see some quality of Nigerians across the board who I believe, with an open mind, um, should be able to deal with most of these issues. I believe that at this level of dialogue, no one should come with any preconceived notions. Oh, I don't like restructuring. No, no, that's not the point. We discuss the issues and then come up with our own solutions, agree, disagree in the national interest. I believe that that capacity is there the, in terms of the avail available human resource base is, 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 is available. Yes, there could be ideological differences. There could be differences um, shaped by uh, the various interests that uh, we represent, and by the way, all these interests are also legitimate in politics. Very, very legitimate. And, and that's the beauty about our country, the diversity, uh, which is why the, this diversity should be protected and not violated and destroyed. See things from different perspectives, there's nothing wrong with it. But you sit down in the national interest, 
and then agree and disagree. Uh, I think that process uh, can come up. But just to, to those who are still skeptical, even with what is going on about uh, fundamental restructuring um, of our country, constitutional reforms, this country in the next couple of years, we are told, will be one of the fourth largest nations on the earth. And if you're going to have 300, 400 million human beings constantly quarreling about fairness, constantly quarreling about whether they should be together or not together, about whether they should move here or not there, that is going to be a disaster. Even as we are, if there's any major crisis, there's no country that can accommodate and solve the Nigerian challenge, except ourselves. Which is why we say, look, you better restructure when there's something to restructure. Better restructure when that makes sense, so that you can have a stable nation. We shouldn't be talking about unity, whether we should be united or not. That should be taken for granted. And these days, Nigerian leaders Sometimes talk about unity without justice. Unity must be founded on justice, on equality of citizenship. That's fundamental. You can, most Nigerian leaders, when, when you listen to them, they say, let's pray for justice, let's pray for unity. Let's work for unity. They forget to qualify it in any human society, even in their own households. If there is unfairness, if there is injustice, even the husband and wife and their children cannot be united. So when people raise issues in a big Nigerian nation, a family of nations and citizens, it shouldn't be surprising to anybody. It's not abnormal. Up till now, even with their rich history, the Scottish people want to be independent of the United Kingdom. And they are always putting a referendum they even have a political party, the Scottish National Party, fighting for that. So these are normal issues in the life of a large nation. You look at the United Kingdom that we send people to, our children, everybody there, we visit London and talk about the Queen and the royal family and so on. We forget that that is a nation of four nations. England, the biggest. You have Scotland. You have Wales, you have Northern Ireland. What is it? Those are the constituent units of the United Kingdom. And if there are issues, they're talking about those issues every time. Talking about those issues every time. So, and that's why to those who are dissatisfied to the point of forming uh, secessionist groups and uh, coming up with an agenda to that effect, some of us with a little knowledge of history, we always make a plea. Yes, yes, things are not perfect. Yes, there are problems. And there's no nation on the face of the earth that is perfect. Nation building is a work in progress. It, the only challenge is challenge of leadership and sincerity on the part of leadership, sincerity on the part of all. For those who think, and this is important, I've said this when I was a keynote speaker at the Southern Senators Forum, when I was uh, governor and chairman of the South South Governors Forum. I delivered a lecture to Southern Senators in Calabar, 2017, where I made the point that nations are united by shared values and ideals. Nations are not held together by military force. Nations are never held together by military force. Otherwise, Soviet Union, the former almighty Soviet Union, wouldn't have disintegrated. They even had nuclear power, nuclear capability. Yet, the Soviet Union ceased to be a nation as we knew it before. Because they ceased to have shared vision. So if you think control of 
any security arm in Nigeria that's not even well equipped can guarantee you unity of Nigeria, you are daydreaming. You are daydreaming and endangering the Nigerian nation. Because that's not possible. In these days where so many things are done on social media, people mobilize, they do all kinds of things. In these days where people bring in all kinds of arms, all kinds of ammunition, all kinds of... If your banking, your thinking, your calculation is control of established security agencies to guarantee Nigerian nation, you have failed. You have failed. We must make the case for a beneficial Nigerian nation that will earn, not by force, they earn, will earn the allegiance and the love, the patriotism of all Nigerians, because everybody wants to be part of this big, strong Nigeria that can be respected. That's what other countries have done. It's not by saying you control uh, one, 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 one that is inefficient, ragtag army you can't defeat, and you think you can defeat an ideology, you can defeat a war that is in the hearts and minds of people, so leaders of Nigeria must be alive to this reality and address the issues of patriotism, address the issues that are dividing the Nigerian nation, create equal citizenship, that's all, and a nation that will be there for all, the big as well as the small. And ask yourselves, is it not is it not an irony? Is it not a shame that we in Nigeria will live here, go to America? Now what is your view on the many borrowers? A nation that is almost Caucasian, founded by Caucasian Martians. You go there, become an American citizen. Our people are there doing well and carrying American passports and they live happy lives. Some even enroll in the American military and security services and fight and die for America. Yet in Nigeria, you are busy looking at who is worshiping which God. You are busy looking at where somebody comes from. It's a shame, shame. Thank you very much, Ario. The issue of electoral reforms is also very important because we must talk about the governance of the country. And I've talked about the central role that leadership plays in a society, or in our case, in our own case the, the nation. You can't make progress without leaders. And so we must be interested in the process through which leaders emerge. And once that process is faulty, you begin to have the wrong place, wrong people in the right places, and so on and so forth. So electoral act amendment is key. Again, uh, I'm, I'm in, the, in, in the committee in the Senate dealing with electoral matters. Uh, and uh, the other thing is we are looking at it, but there's, there are aspects that overlap uh, into the constitutional amendment debates. And I know that uh, a subcommittee has also uh, been asked to work on that, and they have already submitted their report. What I know, without speaking for the Senate or the Constitutional Amendment Committee or the Electoral uh, 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 Matters Committee, for that matter, but I'm a member, so I can speak to what I know, what I've seen, and what I've experienced, uh, is that there is some zeal on the part of members to get that done. But it is regrettable, Ario, that the National Assembly, before the last general elections, painstakingly passed the Electoral Act Amendment, and this president refused to sign, which was why the last elections had a lot of flaws. In my state, votes were hijacked with the use of military and militia, with INEC compromising, with my state garrisoned as governor, because, as I said, governors have no control over security apparatus. We 
which is why we're talking of constitutional amendments and restructuring. And people, people are asking why. The question should be, why not? Why not even yesterday? So the Electoral Act Amendment Bill was passed, but the president didn't sign. Um, I do not believe that that was um, um, a wonderful service to our nation and to our democracy. This president should be encouraged, should be reminded um, to make his own quota in deepening our nation's democratic experience. The same way his predecessor introduced an innovative card reader system, which is why people say we're able to achieve that milestone of an opposition party taking over from a ruling party. So the president should be encouraged to sign. Um, let us see what happens. There is need for civil society, however, to continue to remind the legislature, the National Assembly, and uh, in matters that have to do with constitutional amendment, even the speakers of the various houses, uh, about the need to quickly amend uh, and give this country a new electoral act that can um, lead to transparent, free, and credible elections for our country. Uh, so I share in that, in that, in that aspiration. Uh, we have been launching the HSD Policy Roundtable. This entire event has been sponsored by the HSD Policy Roundtable. Yes, your. Okay. Yes, Let me. <laughs> Where is Ariel? Come on. Yes. So the discussions will continue to send in your own uh, contributions. You can see the email. Are you come this way? Uh, put papers at HSD Policy Roundtable. You can send in your own contribution. This will have so many papers on restructuring and a lot of issues that we have talked about today. The SLA has talked about today. His Excellency he writes a lot and we will be pushing a lot of his thoughts here so we can join the debate, join the conversation and continue having this constructive, like Oga said, constructive this debate on moving the nation forward. So uh, in it, uh, the website is www.hsdpolicyroundtable.com and to send a contribution, just use email uh, papers at hsdpolicyroundtable.com. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you, thank you very much, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Yes. Thank you my general position on on this. My view is that when you are dealing with issues that have to do with national security and the economy, there should be objectivity and no partisanship, because these things are so critical to the life of, of, of a nation. Um, I know that Nigeria's economy started going into a recession before the APC-led federal government came in 2015. Now, the APC government played a lot of terrible, irresponsible, and bad politics. 